Chapter Part 1 Part 1 A man wants to find out about a language course. Listen to the conversation between the man and the woman and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning, University Language Centre. How can I help you? I'm interested in doing a language course. I did Mandarin last year and now I'd like to do Japanese. Can you give me some information about what courses are available at your centre and when they start, that sort of thing? Yes, certainly. Well, we actually offer a number of courses in Japanese at different levels. Are you looking for full-time or part-time? Oh, I couldn't manage full-time as I work every day, but evenings would be fine and certainly preferable to weekends. Well, we don't offer courses at the weekend anyway, but let me run through your options. We have a 12-week intensive course, three hours, three nights a week. That's our crash course. Or an eight-month course, two nights a week. I think the crash course would suit me best as I'll be leaving for Japan in six months' time. Are you a beginner? Not a complete beginner, no. Well, we offer the courses at three levels. Beginners, lower intermediate and upper intermediate, though we don't always run them all. It depends very much on demand. I'd probably be at the lower intermediate level, as I did some Japanese at school, but that was ages ago. Right. Well, the next Level 2 course begins on Monday the 12th of September. There are still some places on that one. Otherwise, you'd have to wait until January or March. No, I'd prefer the next course. The woman asks the man for some details about himself. Look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and complete the form. Right. Can I get some details from you then, so I can send you some information? Sure. What's your name? A family name first. Haggerty. Richard. H-A-G-A-R-T-Y? Uh, no. H-A-G-E-R-T-Y. Oh, OK. And your address, Richard? Well, perhaps you could email it to me. Right. What's your email address? It's ricky45, uh, that's one word, r-i-c-k-y-4-5, at hotmail.com. And I just need some other information for our statistics. This helps us offer the best possible courses and draw up a profile of our students. Fine. What's your date of birth? 
I was born on the 29th of February, 1980. 1980? So you're a leap year baby. That's unusual. Yes, it is. And just one or two other questions for our market research, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. What are your main reasons for studying Japanese? Business, travel or general interest? My company is sending me to Japan for two years. All right, I'll put down business. And do you have any specific needs? Will there be an emphasis on written language? For instance, will you need to know how to write business letters, that sort of thing? No, but I will need to be able to communicate with people on a day-to-day -day basis. OK, so I'll put down conversation. Yes, because I already know something about the writing system at an elementary level and I don't anticipate having to read too much. You said you'd studied some Japanese. Where did you study? Three years at school. Uh, then I gave it up, so I've forgotten a fair bit. You know how it is with languages if you don't have the chance to use them. Yes, but I'm sure it will all come back to you once you get going again. Now, once we receive your enrolment form, we'll contact you. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a man talking on the radio about dogs which help people with their work. First, look at questions 11 and 12. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 and 12. And today, we're taking a look at a number of different breeds of working dogs. And here to report on the dogs with jobs is Kevin Thornhill. Thanks, Joanne. Well, yes, dogs with jobs is the subject of today's programme. Dogs have earned themselves a reputation over the centuries for being extremely loyal. And here's a little story which illustrates just how loyal they are. Just outside the country town of Gundagai in Australia is a statue built to commemorate a dog. A dog which sat waiting for his owner to return to the spot where he'd left him. Well, the story, which was immortalised in a song, has it that the poor dog died waiting for his master, five miles from Gundagai, which is where they built the statue. Now that's what I call loyalty. Now look at questions 13 to 20. As the talk continues, complete the table for questions 13 to 20. 
Well, because of their loyalty and also their ability to learn practical skills, dogs can be trained to do a number of very valuable jobs. Perhaps the most well-known of working dogs is the Border Collie Sheepdog. Sheepdogs which work in unison with their masters need to be smart and obedient, with a natural ability to herd sheep. Some farmers say that their dogs are so smart that they not only herd sheep, they can count them too. Another much-loved working dog is the guide dog, trained to work with the blind. Guide dogs, usually Labradors, need to be confident enough to lead their owner through traffic and crowds, but they must also be of a gentle nature. It costs a great deal of money to train a dog for this very valuable work, but the guide dog associations in the UK, America and Australia receive no government assistance, so all the money comes from donations. Another common breed of work dog is the German Shepherd. German Shepherds make excellent guard dogs and are also very appropriate as search and rescue dogs, working in disaster zones after earthquakes and avalanches. These dogs must be tough and courageous to cope with the arduous conditions of their work, and so that they can be sent anywhere in the world to assist in disaster relief operations, effective dogs and their trainers are now listed on an international database. When you arrive at an airport here, you may be greeted in the baggage hall by a detector dog, wearing a little red coat bearing the words quarantine. These dogs are trained to sniff out fresh fruit as well as meat and even live animals hidden in people's bags. In order to be effective, a good detector dog must have an enormous food drive. In other words, they must really love their food. At Sydney Airport, where there are 10 detector dogs working full time, they stop about 80 people a month trying to bring illegal goods into the country. And according to their trainers, they very rarely get it wrong. Another famous working dog is the Husky. Huskies, which originally came from Siberia, have been used for decades as a means of transport on snow, particularly in Antarctica where they have played an important role. Huskies are well adapted to harsh conditions and they enjoy working in a team. But the Huskies have all left Antarctica now because the International Treaty prohibits their use in the Territory as they are not native animals. Many people were sad to see the dogs leave Antarctica as they had been vital to the early expeditions and earned their place in history along with the explorers. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two university students, Phil and Stella, talking to their tutor about their research project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Come in. Ah, yes, Stella. Is Phil there too? Mm -hmm. Good. Come on in. OK, so you're here to discuss your research project. Have you decided what to focus on? You were thinking of something about the causes of mood changes, weren't you? 
Yes, but the last time we saw you, you suggested we narrowed it down to either the effects of weather or urban environment. So we've decided to focus on the effects of weather. Right, that's more manageable. So your goal is, uh, Phil, to prove the hypothesis. No, to investigate the hypothesis that the weather has an effect on a person's mood.、Hmm, good. And、uh, what's your thesis, Stella? Well, our thesis is that in general, when the weather's good, it has a positive effect on a person's mood, and bad weather has a negative effect.、Hmm. Uh, can you define your terms here? For example, what do you mean by good and bad? Okay. Well, good would be sunny, warm weather, and bad would be when it's cold and cloudy or raining. And how would you define an effect on a person's mood? What would you be looking to find? An effect on the way a person feels.、Mm. Uh, a change in the way they feel,、um, like from feeling happy and optimistic to sad and depressed. Right. And what sort of weather variables will you be looking at? Oh, sunshine, temperature, cloudiness, precipitation, among others. It'll depend a bit what the weather's like when we do the survey. Fine.、Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, what about background reading? I gave you some suggestions. Did you manage to read any of it? Yes, we read the Ross Vickers article, the one comparing the groups of American Marines training in summer and winter.、Hmm. That's quite relevant to our study. It was interesting because the Marines who were training in the cold winter conditions tried to cheer themselves up by thinking of warm places, but it didn't really work.、Hmm. Yes. They were trying to force themselves to have a positive mental outlook, but in fact, it had the opposite effect, and they ended up in a very negative state of mind.、Mm. And we found some more research by someone who wasn't on the reading list you gave us, George Whitebourne. He compared people living in three countries with very different climatic conditions. Actually, he looked at several things, not just the weather. But he found some people's reactions to bad weather were much worse than others, and it was linked to how stressed they were generally.、Uh, the weather on its own didn't have such a significant effect on mood. And we looked at a paper by Haver. Haverton. Yeah, he broke weather up into about fifteen or sixteen categories, and did qualitative and quantitative research. He found that humans respond to conditions in the weather with immediate responses, such as fear or amazement. But these responses can also be linked to associations from their earlier life, such as a particular happy or sad event.、Uh, did you have a look at Stanfield's work? Yes, it was interesting because the type of questions he asked was similar to what we were planning to use in our survey. Yes. He asked people how they were feeling on days with good and bad weather. He found the biggest factors seemed to be the humidity. Moods were most negative on days with a lot of rainfall. Long periods without sunshine had some effect, but nothing like as much.、Hmm. That could be quite a useful model for your project. Yes, we thought so too. Although we can't continue our survey for as long as he did, he did his over a six-month period. You now have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. Right. Well, you've made quite a good start.、Uh, so, where are you going from here? Well, we've already made the questionnaire we're going to use for the survey. It's quite short, just eight questions. We're aiming to survey twenty people over a period of three months, from October to December. We can't specify the actual dates yet because it depends on the weather. We want to do the survey on days with a range of different weather conditions, and we'll just be working on campus, so our data will only be statistically sound for the student population here. That's okay. 
Have you thought how you'll determine what will constitute each aspect of weather and how many you're looking at? We decided on four the amount of sunshine, cloudiness, temperature, and precipitation. We thought we might use the internet to get data on weather conditions on the days we do the survey, but we haven't found the information we need, so we might have to measure it ourselves. We'll see. Then we've got to analyse the results, and we'll do that using a spreadsheet, giving numeric values to answers. And then, of course, we have to present our findings to the class, and we want to make it quite an interactive session. We want to involve the class in some way in the presentation, maybe by trying to create different climatic conditions in the classroom, <laughs> but we're still thinking about it. I see. Well, that sounds as if you're on the right lines. Now, what I'd suggest that you think about, in addition to the work you've done. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear a lecturer in education talking about some experiments done in the USA to investigate the effects of reducing class sizes. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. All over the world, there are passionate arguments going on about how educational systems can be improved. And of all the ideas for improving education, few are as simple or attractive as reducing the number of pupils per teacher. It seems like common sense. But do these ideas have any theoretical basis? Today, I want to look at the situation in the USA and at some of the research that has been done here in America on the effects of reducing class sizes. In the last couple of decades or so, there has been considerable concern in the United States over educational standards here, following revelations that the country's secondary school students perform poorly relative to many Asian and European students. In addition... Statistics have shown that students in the nation's lower-income schools in the urban areas have achievement levels far below those of middle-class and upper-middle-class schools. So would reducing class sizes solve these problems? Well, we have to remember that it does have one obvious drawback. It's expensive. It requires more teachers and possibly more classrooms, equipment, and so on. On the other hand, if smaller classes really do work, the eventual economic benefits could be huge. Better education would mean that workers did their jobs more efficiently, saving the country millions of dollars. It would also mean that people were better informed about their health, bringing savings in things like medical costs and days off sick. So what reliable information do we have about the effects of reducing class sizes? There's plenty of anecdotal evidence about the effect on students' behavior, but what reliable evidence do we have for this?
Let's have a look at three research projects that have been carried out in the USA in the last couple of decades or so. The first study I'm going to look at took place in the state of Tennessee in the late 1980s. It involved some 70 schools. In its first year, about 6,400 students were involved, and by the end of the study, four years later, the total number involved had grown to 12,000. What happened was that students entering kindergarten were randomly assigned to either small classes of 13 to 17 students or regular-sized classes of 22 to 26. The students remained in whatever category they had been assigned to through the third grade, and then, after that, they joined a regular classroom. After the study ended in 1989, researchers conducted dozens of analyses of the data. Researchers agree that there was significant benefit for students in attending smaller classes, and it also appears that the beneficial effect was stronger for minority students. However, there's no agreement on the implications of this. We still don't know the answer to questions like how long students have to be in smaller classes to get a benefit, and how big that benefit is, for example. The second project was much larger and took place in California. Like the Tennessee study, it focused on students from kindergarten through to grade three, but in this case, all schools throughout the state were involved. The experiment is still continuing, but results have been very inconclusive, with very little improvement noted. And the project has, in fact, also had several negative aspects. It meant an increased demand for teachers in almost all California districts. So the better-paying districts got a lot of the best teachers, including a fair number that moved over from the poorer districts. And there were a lot of other problems with the project. For example, there weren't any effective procedures for evaluation. All in all, this project stands as a model of what not to do in a major research project. A third initiative took place in the state of Wisconsin at around the same time as the California project began. And it's interesting to compare the two. The Wisconsin project was small. Class sizes were reduced in just 14 schools, but it was noteworthy because it targeted schools at which a significant proportion of the students were from poor families, compared with California's one-size-fits-all approach. Analysts have found that the results are very similar to the Tennessee project, with students making gains that are statistically significant and that are considerably larger than those calculated for the California initiative. Now, I'd like to apply some of these ideas to the latest... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.